Welcome to the third webinar in our series on response and resilience in the supply chains amid COVID-19. Thank you for joining us today. I would like to thank our sponsors, the Port of Newcastle, Macquarie Business School, and also thank you to our supporters, um, Australian Supply Chain Institute, uh, MGSM Alumni Association, and the Center for Workforce Futures. We'd like to begin uh, with a quick technical overview. If you'd like to ask a question of any of our panelists, please send it via the Zoom Q&A button. Uh, we welcome your questions and observations and we'll try and uh, address as many of them as we can. If you're having any technical difficulties, um, Billy Bruce from our IT team is here. Either email him or send him a message on the Zoom Q&A button. Thank you, Billy. My name is Norma Harrison, and I'm a professor of management at Macquarie Business School. I'm going to serve as the moderator for our session today. We've got a great team here providing support for this webinar. I'm assisted by Razia Tavaloy and Roger Moza, Dr. Roger Moza, both from Macquarie Business School. The third webinar in the series is called COVID-19 Postmortem, where we look at lessons learned and moving forward uh, for organizations and supply chains. We have a very interesting group of presenters, all leaders in supply chain strategy and implementation. And I will introduce uh, each of them as uh, we are going to have presentations from them. The first one I want to introduce, Olaf Shatterman. Olaf, a partner from the global consultancy Bain & Company, has developed a great reputation leading global supply chain procurement and enterprise-wide cost transformations across many industries. I first met Olaf Shatterman when he was managing director Accenture Strategy, Supply Chain and Operations. And I was very impressed with his knowledge and practice, partic particularly of digital operations and supply chain strategy. I present to you, Olaf Shatterman. Thank you, Norma, and uh, welcome everybody to today's session. The world's response to COVID-19 has been truly impressive, and it has taught us a few lessons. There are three key insights I'd like you to take away from this session today. Firstly, disruption is the new normal. The magnitude and the frequency of disruptive events continues to grow, meaning COVID-19 is not an isolated event in terms of supply chain disruption. The assumptions and the business rules we have historically run our supply chains on are no longer valid. And thirdly, your supply chain can offer much more than a shelter in the storm. It can actually give you a competitive edge. So let's talk through the logic behind each of these. Disruption is the new normal. Um, whilst you may not have realized that you know, the frequency and the magnitude of supply chain disruptions continues to rise, as you can see on this page, right? From, from natural disasters, trade wars, um, you know, Ebola outbreaks, um, other health crises, but also cybersecurity attacks. And it affects companies in, in a significant way, no matter what the metric is. So whether it's share price, we saw Lenovo um, suffering a 50% drop in share price, equivalent to a $1 billion drop in market cap when the US tariffs on goods from China were announced. Uh, floods in Thailand, for example, forced the closure of Honda's manufacturing facilities, which resulted in a 5% drop in global output or approximately $5 billion in lost sales or even in Brazil where a driver dispute resulted in, in the inventory culling of 70 million poultry board birds, which was also equivalent to a uh, billion dollars in inventory. Now, you may think some of those have not impacted your supply chain, but they did disrupt somebody else's supply chain and the magnitude and the impact can be extreme. Um, so therefore it's, it's important to think about what could, what could happen to you. The ongoing disruption means that the assumptions and business rules we have long used to manage our supply chains are no longer valid. Consolidating volume to a single supplier in return for lower unit costs no longer holds as the COVID crisis has demonstrated. You need to have alternative suppliers for critical components and elements just in case one of them is disrupted. 
one global FMCG company, for example, had diversified its sourcing of critical ingredients across global suppliers in anticipation of a supply disruption such as COVID-19 and is reaping the benefits now. Over the past 15 years of lean, we have worked under the assumption that inventory is bad and must be reduced at all costs. There are plenty of companies foregoing incremental sales right now because of these inventory shortages. And suppliers have long been held at arm length and managed for cost. But a leading global snack brand has increased its level of communication with its co-manufacturer to manage demand, proactively plan for additional production runs and ensure safety protocols. And that alternative collaborative relationship is working really well for them right now. And having true upstream, upstream supply chain visibility is often thought as too difficult and too costly, making it uneconomic to build real improvement. But one of the world's largest food companies has implemented a rapid low tech control tower to monitor, monitor its North American supply chain, enacting rapid changes like rationalization to production of hero SKUs. But the sad truth is that as we shift into recovery, you will all come under renewed pressure to solve for these old assumptions in the name of rapid recovery and profit restoration. So if you look at, on the chart on, on the next page, you can see that supply chain risk needs to be balanced with supply chain resilience. If you don't have enough resilience, you're vulnerable. And if you build in too much resilience, you may be destroying profit. So if you were once in position A on this chart, you may now find yourself in location B due to increased risk and you become more vulnerable. So now's the time to evaluate selective investments into supply chain resilience in order to move back to position C on the chart and achieve an appropriate level of resilience that matches to your vulnerability. This sounds depressing. We've often read that moving forward, supply chains have to do much more than just react and be responsive. So supply chains need to be resilient, but it looks like from your diagram, supply chain resilience is gonna be very difficult to achieve. So what do companies and supply chains need to do to become more resilient? Yeah, Norma, great, great question, obviously. And, and let's, let's talk about this on this day. So if you think about your end-to-end -end supply chain from plan, source, make, through sell, fulfill, and servicing your customers, then I can see that you need to have multiple layers of capability within that supply chain system. Supply chains that institutionalize these best practices, they build and enhance the five capabilities in each of the layers on this page. So not only to weather the next storm better, but they actually will provide a competitive edge. And the first one of these capabilities is network agility. It's all about being able to react quickly to disruption, and it requires a flexible ecosystem of locations, suppliers, and partners that can handle shortfalls, switch between different channels, or even produce brand new products. Some companies will be wondering whether to exit China altogether. And however, several organizations I spoke with recently have lauded how quickly the Chinese economy has sprung back into action. What has become evident to everybody though is because of the nature of this global pandemic is that having a single point of failure is the problem. Not necessarily which country you source or you manufacture or whether you have outsourced or own the plants and the DCs. That's why some uh, who are dependent on uh, purely on offshore production are moving some manufacturing onshore or closer to their core markets. Um, for example, um, a global food company has maximized capacity utilization at its primary and secondary co-manufacturers, but it's also recently added a new one to meet demand. And Toyota has already learned from previous disruptions and has reduced risk by mandating one supplier produce maximum 60% of the needed parts and the additional suppliers each produce 20. The second layer is then all about digital collaboration. As you are switching on new suppliers and partners in your ecosystem, you ideally want cloud-based supply chain applications, and collaborative platforms and tools to enhance information sharing with easy plug and play interfaces so you can avoid lengthy and costly integration. And these tools can also improve the quality and the speed of decision-making within your organization and with your ecosystem. The third one is then once you're connected to your ecosystem, you can then aim for real-time network visibility. Supply chain control tower solutions, 5G technology, blockchain, office leadership teams, real-time visibility across the network from sub-tier suppliers to identifying shifting demand through market signals. And then combine production capacity data and real-time demand signals, including things like big data, leaders plan to meet supply with forecast demand. 
Uh, Procter & Gamble, for example, uh, deployed a cloud-based platform to provide real-time information on production and external demand to its supply chain control tower. And that strategy really helped them to minimize the fallout when Hurricane Sandy slammed into New Jersey, disrupting production at a factory which produced 91% of its perfumes. Insights generated, however, by that platform helped the company to make the right decisions quickly, limiting the downtime to only two and a half days. And then the fourth layer is a cognitive engine to rapidly generate insights. You are connected, you've got real-time information, now what are you gonna do with it? Right? And leadership teams can stay ahead of supply chain disruptions by improving their ability to rapidly analyze internal data and external sources of big data. And that means harnessing machine learning and AI for predictive and, pred and prescriptive analytics. Those tools can give you early warning technologies, you know, model risk scenarios, develop pre-programmed responses. And an increased level of disruption also often requires an update to the planning parameters and the objectives since the old assumptions are no longer valid. Um, a global personal care leader, for example, says that having the right systems in place is the key enabler that they need to see demand signals. They express the need for faster and more advanced scenario modeling to conduct what if analysis for speed to insight. They want to know where is the demand, where can I produce, and how do I align those rapidly. They can do that now, but no one here as fast as they should be able to. The ability to rapidly model would help them to avoid changing geographies of production, for example. And then last but not least, you need empowered teams. Decentralized teams can have quickly, can react quickly to insights generated by advanced analytics and also create the rapid recovery capabilities that will help companies navigate smoothly. For example, one global confectionery leader emphasized the importance to have a really high caliber talent in the supply chain team to have a huge responsibility in these situations. And that's really the five capabilities, Norma, in, in relation to your question. Um, I hope that was clear. Um, there's a couple of things that companies can do pretty quickly in terms of asking themselves some questions um, that are on this page. You know, where could they be disrupted again? You know, what could you institutionalize from, from the responses? You know, we were just talking about it before this um, uh, seminar where <clears throat> companies have acted in a way that they have never been able to do before in terms of short-circuiting analysis, paralysis, et cetera, taking fast, bold action. Um, but also think about what is the downside of taking action to increase your resilience, right? Will the market and your stakeholders reward you or punish you for increasing your resilience? That was what I had to say, Norma. Um, back to you. Thank you, Olaf Shatterman. Uh, you've given us some really valuable food for thought, not just reacting and being responsive to the crisis, but moving forward what companies and supply chains have to really get on with. So at this stage, I'd like to introduce to you Craig Carmody. I'd like to introduce to you the Chief Executive Officer of the Port of Newcastle, um, who has extensive experience in the transport, maritime and infrastructure sectors. He has held senior positions in the Maersk Group, and in the Australian federal government, as well as in the Australian army and special forces. Craig Carmody is actually living and operating within our webinar title of Moving Forward, where he is tasked with diversifying the regional and international trade of the Port of Newcastle. So I present to you, Craig Carmody. Thank you, Norman. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, like many countries, Australia is currently exploring rebuilding its manufacturing industry. Um, uh, however, manufacturing is one thing. To be competitive, to be successful, we need a supply chain that efficiently supports it. Uh, now, the image you're seeing there, if you can't distinguish it, they're trucks and trains with toilet paper in the back. Um, as you would have seen around the world, particularly in Australia, the virus created some interesting consumer behaviour and one was the hoarding of toilet paper. Now in Australia, the manufacturing industry was able to ramp up quite quickly to meet that surge in demand. But where we fell over was in our supply chain. The, the Australia is very reliant on one mode of transport, it's trucks. We don't use rail or coastal shipping um, anywhere near as much as the rest of the world. And what it led to was a significant gap between the um, 
supply and demand points in our supply chain. That's just one example and one lesson that we've already learned in Australia about the supply chain. It should focus our attention on the need to change the fundamentals in what mode of transport is selected. Um, obviously, we have a bias in a maritime port operation that we would always argue for the most efficient, the heaviest lift mode. Um, it will be um, interesting to see in the aftermath of this what public policy setting, what government settings will occur in Australia to um, better spread our transport supply chain. Um, I have to say, I, as Norma mentioned, I have spent a lot of time in politics. I know how hard it is to um, change these, these matters, but it is one of the key things that I hope that we will take away from this experience. The next one I wanted to touch on is there is um, a lot of conversations going on about let's not return to business as usual, let's not return to politics as usual, let's move forward and create a new way of doing things. One of the challenges um, that we've seen in the supply chain is, is that after more than two decades of minimum staffing cost cutting, there was not a lot of redundancy within our supply chains and the single biggest risk certainly that we experienced at the port was the virus getting into that supply chain. Demand was there, the risk was not being able to meet that demand. Now, the conversations that have been going on publicly, are, well, we will need to create a more resilient supply chain. I think then there's a dot, 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 and people think, well, we'll put more people into the supply chain, we'll, we'll actually create some redundancy in the system. I think the way that this will play out is you can look at the supply chain of one of two ways. It's a reminder that a business is literally made up of its people or that people are the risk pinch point in the supply chain and that risk needs to be mitigated. Um, it's a rather depressing thought, but I suspect strongly that most supply chain businesses will gravitate to the latter and we will see a um, faster take up of digitalization and automation within the supply chain rather than seeking to fix the problem through hiring more people. This is an, um, a wonderful slide. It shows what's going on in um, the maritime industry, global shipping. There is a consolidation going on into larger ships, so more capacity on less ships. And the shipping industry was, you know, if you want to lose money, shipping industry is the second best place to do it after airports and air airlines. But you will see what's going on in the global fleet there is a consolidation into bigger and bigger ships. These are the 18,000 um, 20 foot equivalent to your container boxes. And that will create, that creates a more efficient uh, maritime operation. It also creates a greener maritime operation. Um, the maritime industry has to move to a carbon neutral position by 2050. One of the challenges for Australia is, is that in our supply chain, we do not have any ports in Australia that can handle vessels um, at the 14,000 and above, let alone, in fact, it struggles at just over 11,000. Um, I, uh, just as an aside, at the Port of Newcastle, we do see that supply chain weakness as an opportunity. We, we will, uh, Norman mentioned, we're going to diversify the business. We will create one of those ultra large container terminal ports because it will actually create more efficiency and um, productivity into the supply chain for Australia no matter what happens with our manufacturing industry, Australia will always be a trading nation because it's an island nation. Um, so that is another um, area that I think we will focus on post the virus. The big challenge, the final thing I'd like to touch on is the world supply chain actually was already being forced to change before the virus hit us. Um, the virus is an extra complexity and driver, but the actual challenge that we've been dealing with for some time has been climate change because it's structural. And just two points I'd draw out of my experience at the board in Newcastle. The first is the global investment and debt, just the entire equity and debt market has been moving away from fossil fuel related businesses. Um, we are the world's largest coal port seeking to diversify. And to give you a sense, 23 investment institutions in the world or financial institutions in the world will not touch the port of Newcastle because of our reliance on coal as our major trade. So you can imagine the changes that we were already seeking to implement well before the virus arrived. 
And for us, the virus, quite honestly, is a bit of a moment in time. The climate change issues that we're dealing with you know, in investor space is much greater risk to us. I noticed from your last two slides, it looks like you're carrying the banner for sustainability and pushing towards reducing the carbon footprint. Now, isn't this going beyond your brief of managing a major port facility and its surrounding infrastructure? Uh, well, no, I would argue no. Um, the world, whilst we're all focused on the virus, absolutely. Um, and, you know, we saw in all of, um, slides before, it mentioned the Australian wildfires. Back in January, climate change, bushfires, Australia basically got burned to the ground. Everybody was talking about climate change. The virus has come along, everybody's talking about the virus. The climate change challenges to business, and I mean, yes, we can talk about the global um, environment, but just from a business point of view, those challenges have not gone away. And, and this slide gives you an example and gives you a very stark idea of what the port is dealing with. Just take one component of climate change, which is rising sea levels. You will see there that we don't have much choice. Um, we have a lot of reclaimed land. A lot of ports do have reclaimed land. So a considerable percentage of our port land is actually in flood areas, in low-lying areas of reclaimed. Um, if we lost half our berths to rising sea levels, that's a significantly bigger impact on our business than the pandemic, which we're able to manage through isolation, through information systems, through remote work. Um, it means that either we move our infrastructure, we build our infrastructure in better places, we put in incredibly expensive infrastructure to try and prevent the, those sea um, levels being inundating our infrastructure. So you can imagine um, where our focus has to be on, yes, there are immediate ones that we can deal with, and then there's these much bigger ones, which we, you know, we are only one business in a global effort. Um, so you can see where our focus, where our money, and where a lot of our attention goes to. Um, and look, I'll, I'll just wrap up. Um, it was mentioned in the introduction that I worked um, with the MERS group. I was head of strategy and innovation within the MERS group for, that was my last job before I came here. And I spent a lot of time in Copenhagen. One of my favorite stories was about the, the Danish Navy. And so in 1807, the British destroyed the Danish fleet almost entirely. So the Danish king at the time ordered a forest of oak trees planted so they could rebuild their national fleet. In 1979, 172 years later, the Danish Department of Defense received a letter from the Danish Department of Agriculture telling them that their oak trees were ready for collection. And I love that story because from an innovation point of view, from a resilience point of view, Whilst humorous, it also tells you that if you take too long to do something, you will miss your chance. And I believe that the challenges that we at the port have been experiencing, uh, the maritime industry experiencing from climate change, the virus and some of the lessons we've learned from that feed nicely into the stuff that we have to do. We have to learn how to be, have long-term sustainability and resilience. And I just hope we don't forget the lessons that we've only just recently rather pointedly learned. Thank you, Norman. Thank you, Craig Carmody. You've certainly given us a different lens and a wider view of the roles and responsibilities of our transport industry and how important the developments here are for our supply chains. So thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, Stephen, Stephen Melnick. Stephen Mel Melnick is no stranger to us. He is one of our panelists. He was one of our panelists in our webinar one of the series and he's been absolutely generous with his guidance throughout the organization of this webinar series. Stephen Melnick is a professor of operations and supply chain management uh, at the very credible uh, Eli Broad College of Business in Michigan State University in the US. Although I do regard him as an associate resident of Australia and a great friend of this country. Stephen Melnick is widely respected for his ability to cross the, uh, cross the gap between theory and practice. And so it is fitting that in this third webinar, 
he summarizes our journey of reacting, responding, and now moving forward, rethinking responsiveness post COVID-19. I present to you, Professor Stephen Meldick. Thank you, Norman. Thank you for your kind words. In some ways, my session is going to be the easiest because a lot of the foundations have been very beautifully laid by Craig and by Olaf. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to emphasize certain things. And specifically, we're going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about the lessons learned. And points two and three are really going to come together, which is how do we react and what's the new normal, which I think is an important question. Everywhere we're now recognizing that it's not going to be a return to business as normal, even though a large number of companies are going to assume that. What are the lessons learned? Some of these I'm not going to cover because they've been beautifully done elsewhere. But I'm just going to focus on a couple. Number one, what this pandemic has done to us is it's recognized, it's forced us to understand the importance of something we've taken for granted for a long period of time, safety. We have never worried about the safety of our food, the safety of our working environment, the safety of our products. But the COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to recognize that safety is a paramount consideration to the extent that recently Ford announced that it was opening up its plants in Michigan. One of the plants, the UAW, which you would have thought would have been really interested in seeing their workers go back to work, informed them that they wanted to have every worker tested for COVID-19. Olaf has done a great job on the cost-driven supply chain and its problems. Craig has really made us understand that digital is here to stay. But I'm going to hit you with a couple of others. What this COVID-19 has made us aware of is the importance of fast decision-making. As a professor of business, I see a lot of my colleagues teaching deliberate decision-making. But what we saw succeed was the ability of people to come together, look at outcomes, desired outcomes, and to make decisions quickly. In essence, they were rediscovering what CNN, which is one of the major news broadcasting networks, had discovered some 25 years ago when they introduced the 15-minute stand-up meeting. When a major event took place, 15 minutes, decision made. One more thing that I want to also get you to understand is we're starting to understand that nobody can attack this by themselves. We're going to require collaboration. Within the supply chain, that's collaboration upstream with your suppliers and downstream with your customers. And this is going to force us to look at issues such as, are we a good customer? And finally, we've seen that this has been an interesting period because this has been where politics, not economics, has played a primary role. When one of the presidential elections was taking place, the, the mantra was, it's the economy, stupid. And now we're starting to find it's the politics, stupid. We are starting to see problems with collaboration in the United States, in Great Britain, and in Brazil. So what are we looking at? Well, some of the things we've picked up, I'm just going to go over very quickly. We've understood that in the short term, we can free up capacity and become much more responsive by doing things like reducing setups, reducing discretionary usage of capacity, for example, for preventive maintenance, ramping up overtime, reducing stock keeping units by rationalization. We're also, and we can ship directly, we're also starting to see the emergence of our strategies, repurposing existing products. We can remapping the supply chain. So if one part's unable to do it, can we go through another way? Reconfiguring equipment. What we're also trying to see very interestingly is that companies are recognizing that maybe the answer lies in redesign, taking an existing product and redesigning it so it can be much more easily made. The N95 mask has now been redesigned so it can be vacuum formed out of plastic. The result is a product which does all the per functionality but can be made much more quickly and it's easier to sanitize. And finally, recognize success. So those are some things we've learned. But what's really becoming important is that we have to, we're still assessing the impact. In a recent McKinsey and Company study, which went across the world literally, what they found out is one major theme was that there's the sentiment is that there's still uncertainty about the economy, the duration of the pandemic and public health. That's a unifying thread. However, we're starting to see some developments which we saw occur now, which are gonna go away. Uh, curbside pickups, where you could go to a place and pick up your groceries, for example. That's not gonna be a long-term affair. However, uh, distance learning for children. We, we're finding out that children learn better if they're in a group at school. 
some of the developments will in fact continue to play a role. And here's where digital is going to become important. I have a question for you. Sure. And as Steve and Melnick, we've often discussed how the business policy of organizations need to be re-examined and often changed. So in this context of supply chains and the COVID-19 crisis, what's the, this concept of a business model that we're talking about and how is it changing? What you've really done is something important. Uh, people use the term business model as if it's fairly well defined. Some years ago, one of our major jurists, a guy named Oliver Wendell Holmes, said that he could not define pornography, but he knew it when he saw it. And that's our equivalent of the business model. What I found is that the business model is strategy operationalized. It's three things. It's who's our key customer, what do they want? What's the value proposition? Where are the capabilities? The intersection is where we deliver value. What the current pandemic has shown us is that companies which can readjust their business model to take advantage of, of changes in customer requirements in changes in terms of value propositions are the most successful. And so if you flip over to the next slide, Norma, what you're going to find is we've seen some really interesting winners and losers. What are some of the winners? One of the biggest winners was, has been Amazon. Somebody has once remarked that Amazon is a company that was designed for a pandemic. It was designed around quick decision making, rapid scalability, and massive and ability to use big data. It has been one of the biggest winners in the digital revolution. We're also seeing companies like Domino's, which recognized that people wanted safety, so they delivered contactless delivery, where you could get a pizza without having to go out and meet the delivery person. Zoom, the very platform we're on. Universal Studios, which discovered that you don't have to go through a movie theater in order to sell your movies. You can do it directly to the customers, and they're doing that. They found out with the movie, the uh, Troll World Tour, that they could go directly to the consumers, rent videos through platforms like iTunes, and make over $100 million in the first week. The losers? Malls. As we come together, these will have problems about how do we allow people to interact and be safe. Social distancing and malls do not interact. Hertz. Hertz is a company which has been built around two markets. The market for airplane traffic as people come off the airplane and the market for accidents. If you have a problem, you rent a Hertz car. They haven't been able to adjust and haven't been able to repurpose their capacity. AMC theaters, the same thing. And finally, Airlines are becoming the big losers. It is now going to be recognized that as we reemerge, we're going to have to offer social distancing, which means the infamous middle seat, the bane of every traveler, is no longer going to be occupied, which means occupancy is going to be down. So how do firms, firms react? And I'm just going to make a point. Not every company will recognize that there's an opportunity. Some companies will be like the ostrich, and they think that things will return to the old way. Guess what? They're not. Even though it's very attractive, some companies, because of lack of capital, because of the need to reestablish balance sheets, because they don't know any better, are going to try to go back to the old norm. These companies will become the mediocre mass. In reality, what we're going to start to see is some really important differences. And what are the differences? And I'd like to kind of kind of hit on a couple. We've talked about rethinking resilience. We got to do it. We got to think about using our supply chain to sense. We also have to think about, and we've talked about terms of like collaboration. Olaf talked about transparency. Now I'm going to hit on two issues. We have to think about why, but working with our suppliers and being a good customer, and also rethinking the idea that the supply chain is now strategic. We did a study for the Department of the Navy last year. Michigan State, and the Navy want to know, are we a good customer? And one of the things we found is in the research, no one looks at the supplier. And yet, the supplier is critical. So we went out to over 1,300 suppliers in a four-week period, and we did a study, and we found out, guess what? There are 21 things that suppliers look at, and this gives you an idea. And this is not unusual. Here's something to think about I'm going to leave you with. Why collaboration with the supply chain is so important. In the auto industry, there's a concept called the Working Relationship Index, WRI. 
Every automotive company monitors that like a hawk. Why? Because of its impact. To what extent are you viewed as a good customer? In 2015, the people who developed this index asked a simple question. If everyone could have improved by the same level as the, as the two major benchmarks, which are Toyota and Honda, which was 8.3%, how much would their bottom lines have improved? The answer was over $2 billion, or their operating margins would have increased from 8% to 23%. We're now starting to find that they, we're not here by ourselves. And by, one more comment here, and I'm going to stop because I'm taking too much. This is a model we're developing for another governmental agency. And one of the things we're going to talk about is the outer circle. What's the outer circle? Recognizing that you have to look outside of your supply chain for capabilities. We've seen examples of where the medical industry has gone to the automotive industry to find suppliers who have the capability to provide certain products and recruiting them in. And that's expanding your supply chain. The irony is in 2018, when I was in Australia at Newcastle, University of Newcastle, we had an example of a company which had developed the capability and asked a question of the government, how do I market this? Today is the environment, the time for us to look at these issues. You're gonna solve your problem, not by looking at your own supply chain, but looking at the overall economy. Thank you, Norma. Thank you, Stephen Malnick. Um, that's been a very insightful journey you've taken us for the response and resilience of supply chain amid COVID-19. So at this point, I'd like us to go on to have a look at some of our takeaways. And this has been uh, put together, actually. I've, I've, I've gathered all this from um, our different speakers. And the first one is that disruption is the new normal. Is a new normal. So, Craig Carbody, would you like to just make a quick uh, comment on this one? Um, yeah, as I said, I, I see it as a short-term challenge, but the lessons have much broader application into um, other challenges that I think we're all facing. Yeah, and it's not an isolated event, is it, Olaf? <clears throat> no, it's not, uh, Norma. As you as you have seen in in um, our analysis, uh, the the magnitude and the frequency is uh, is increasing, and and this uh, mm -hmm. definitely has been at a scale that we haven't seen before because it's been so global. It has hit everybody, but um, right. supply chain disruptions have been going on for a while. Yeah. Yeah, and we're also seeing that this uh, post COVID nineteen world will be very different. Um, Stephen, what do you think? Very much so. Uh, what we're starting to see is that as people look at issues such as safety, responsiveness, uh, resilience, uh, they're going to have to think about how do they service their customers differently? What new capabilities do they have? Uh, we're also going to find that it's going to be different because our customers have changed, our supply chains have changed, and our business models have changed. Mm -hmm. uh, we're now moving into an environment where we have to act fast because if you don't act fast, you basically die. And we see also that the assumptions and the business models have changed exactly. too, right? Um, uh, so Olaf, you, you were talking earlier on about how our assumptions are, are changed. Absolutely, you know, our, our eternal quest for the single lowest cost and for a lean and for minimizing of inventories has proven to be uh, maybe a good strategy when you think about unit cost, but if you think about system cost, uh, it's been totally blown out the window. This is uh, some firms and supply chains will not not succeed. So, uh, Olaf, since you're there, uh, why? Why is this the case? Well, I think that um, it's been evident in, in the last uh, you know few months that some firms who have been able to react quickly and have been able to um, maintain their cadence, uh, you know, through this time and shown the agility, shown the level of collaboration with their supply base, um, you know, have, have come through. And, and, you know, I think when you talk about the capabilities, the five capabilities that I was describing earlier, mm -hmm. um, when, when they all come together, then you can achieve more than a shelter in the store, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which your supply chain can offer during crisis times. Um, if you think about, you know, uh, for example, Dyson, who was a late entrant into the ventilator race, well, they collaborated with TTP, which was a medical technology company, to leverage their expertise in airflow devices. 
and within 10 days, they were able to bring a medical respirator to the market. Well, that, that's uh, you know, a product development lead time of 10 days for something like that is incredible. And so I think the companies that can do that, they will have a role to succeed in the future. There's a greater role for the supply chain. So uh, Craig Carvedy, you're talking very much of automation and digitalization. Yeah, um, the, the, the microscope on the weaker points in the supply chain will have to happen. And, and picking up on something Steve said during his presentation, that collaboration and transparency. For example, we were doing everything we could to preserve, protect ourselves in the port, but we had to actually reach out to the rail, um, rail network and to the rail operators to see what they were doing to protect their drivers. Because if they fell over, well, there's no product coming into the port. And, and that, that is going to change how companies talk, business to business conversations occur. Yes, and um, uh, Steve, we were saying, uh, discussing earlier on about this uh, very interesting uh, quotation by Deming. Yeah, and let me talk about that. I'm, I'm, I like the question you've asked for several reasons. Number one, some organizations are going to fail because they're not willing to take chances. If you're going to succeed in today's environment, you have to be willing to take a chance. And some organizations are organized to discourage risk taking. And secondly, you're going to have to be willing to listen to everything we're saying. This is not a piecemeal reaction. Uh, some years ago, uh, W. Edward Deming, who is the fa one of the fathers of total quality management, was doing a seminar in Cincinnati, and he was approached by the board of directors of one of the major organizations. I'll give you a hint. It was talked about in this presentation. And the CEO, and who was also the chair of the board, said to Dr. Deming, surely we don't have to do all of this to succeed. Dr. Deming was somewhat taken aback, and he stopped, and he says, no, you do not have to. Survival, he pointed out, after all, is not mandatory. And I think that's what we have to re recognize is that when you're bringing about a change, some companies are not going to do it. Survival is not a right given to any organization. Right. Okay. And so um, I think we have to move on here. And uh, the last two points, the main thing is that we have to accept uncertainty and plan for it. And the time is now. The time is now for transformations and reconfigurations. So at this stage, what I'd like to do is a question from, uh, for Craig Carmody. Uh, Craig, we have a question from Chicago, from uh, Delton Anito. And he's saying, to create a new supply chain network to cope with the new desired outcomes, uh, he's interested in whether Australia has the capital investment to support the new change? Um, Australia does from two points of view. We have a, a guaranteed superannuation system in Australia, um, like um, the pension funds in, in North America. So we do have a lot of capital, but obviously we take in a lot of international capital. That said, um, like has happened in um, the US, there's been a bit of a rise in anti-China feelings and and we do get a lot of our capital from there as a business, a port business particularly. Um, the, the money's there and I'm sure Olaf can speak or Steve can speak too. Credit is actually quite cheap and easy to get at the moment globally. Um, mm. I think the bigger challenge is going to be where do we spend it? It's not a question of getting in, it's the smart spending that I think will determine the success over the next decade or so. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank, thanks for that. Um, and for Olaf Schatterman, we have a question from Marcello. And he says, I have considerations about your, your fifth layer, uh, the one on empowered organizations in terms of capabilities that you've got to have. And uh, he'd like to ask whether you include learning and knowledge management to empower the organizations. Yeah, absolutely. As we, as we have seen uh, you know, during this pandemic, uh, you know, you, you can have the best uh, capabilities and processes and technology, but, you know, you still need uh, a really strong and powered frontline. And so learning and knowledge management uh, to help build talent uh, and, and some of the, the companies, some of the clients that I've spoken with have really stressed how important it is to have the absolute best talent uh, empowered and on the front line to rapidly make decisions, right? Because we all agree, I think on this panel that rapid decision-making has been, you know, front and central in, in, in the last few months. 
And in order to do that, you need, you need great people, right? Because we need great information, but you still need great people to do that. And so, you know, investing into and building uh, talent uh, through learning, um, through knowledge management is, is critical, absolutely. All right, so whilst you are still with us, Ola Shatterman, this is a question again from Delton. Wow, you're very active here. Um, are countries going to bring manufacturing onshore than offshore? Yeah, look, that's a great question. And I've been uh, asked that question by many, many companies uh, uh, and organizations recently, uh, including uh, uh, the media with, with um, you know, different motives, I suppose. But, um, you know, we all, we all know that, uh, that there is a push, uh, you know, from certain governments to, to move manufacturing out of, for example, China uh, or out of Asia, et cetera, right? And, and if you think back about what I was talking about earlier, it is not about whether I manufacture, you know, in my own backyard or in China or in India. In fact, a lot of companies have lauded how, how quickly the Chinese economy has sprung back into action, right? Mm -hmm. If I have a factory and I'm, and I'm dependent upon it solely and it's in my backyard and I get hit with COVID-19 case, I stop production, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's our ability to actually have an agile network where I take out a single uh, point of failure, that is what's going to make companies um, uh, successful. And so that might mean uh, a network of offshore and some onshore manufacturing. And the good thing is now with industry 4.0 technology, we can actually reduce the cost um, of high, high skilled labor in a local manufacturing plant. So I think we're going to see a mix. Uh, certainly, you know, for example, in the electronics industry, it is virtually at the moment impossible to pull that out of south, south of China. Uh, the capabilities, the layers and the tiers of suppliers there that are required to actually assemble and, and produce uh, is not something that we can change overnight. So mm -hmm. it will be very industry dependent and very company dependent. Right. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Stephen Melnick, we have a question. I think uh, Lindsay Brin has been very interested in you talking about the good uh, customer. So um, the question is, how hard is it to measure the value of being a good customer? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, let me start by giving you a couple of things. Um, when, we look at, when we look at supply chains, a lot of the research is focused on what makes for, you know, asking the buyer, what are you looking for in the supplier? There's very little research talking about what does a supplier look for in a buyer? And when that question was first proposed uh, some years ago, what people found out is there's some real benefits by being a good customer. What's the benefit? Number one, preferred pricing. Number two, you get priority in decision-making, joint problem solving. I had one example. I was talking to someone at Boeing who talked about the importance of being a good customer. He said, he's been in a situation where too often when there's a problem, you get someone who approaches you from the supplier and you can tell they're the A-team, the top. And as soon as you, you agree to work with them, then you get the three stooges coming in the door. And if you're the preferred customer, you get those people right off the bat. You get the best people. And finally, first access to innovation, new developments. That's one reason why in 2015, when the people who were measuring the working relationship index, they saw the qualitative benefits. They saw numerous examples in cases. And when they tried to quantify it, they were amazed by the fact that it has a real impact on the bottom line. The fact that in the United States, in our automotive industry, GM, Ford, and Chrysler, now Fiat Chrysler America, are struggling, yet Honda and Toyota are not, is not a miracle. It's because they've recognized that if they're going to succeed, they have to be backed up by a good supplier base. And that means they have to be preferred. And in fact, what we're starting to see is research coming out of uh, Michigan State, which is talking about the value of being preferred. And we're talking about it as what's the value of, being, of having P status, being the preferred supplier or the preferred customer. Mm. And what we're finding out it's immeasurable. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I have a question for Craig Carmody from Jeff, who um, uh, he says that you mentioned a greater appetite for automation 
Uh, so the question is, as the majority of the workforce are employed by small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, uh, do you see the same appetite in this group? That will be harder. That, that'll become a question of what their capital um, ability to actually fund these sort of changes occur. Um, uh, look, one of the risks is that those SMEs will get taken over. Um, you'll, you'll get more vertically integrated, larger organisations uh, controlling the supply chain. Um, uh, you know, to, to pick up on what Olive said a little bit earlier, that's going to be industry and business based. Um, we certainly, uh, like as a port, we, we now are looking at touching the supply chain points all the way back to the, well, in our case, the coalface at the moment, but back to the farms. Um, and that will be to assist a more efficient supply chain. But you can imagine bigger companies than us with deeper pockets might just go, well, we'll just control the supply chain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to add to that. I think that's a great point, Craig. Um, you know, I, I think when we talk about automation or digitization, right? It, it, obviously, there will be there will be a, a push on automation in terms of you know replacing labour with with technology. But I think where where we've seen the majority of the effort focus on right now is around creating connectedness and visibility mm -hmm. and transparency mm -hmm. up and down the supply chain, right? Where where companies have had to create this upstream visibility very rapidly. And certainly when I think about Southeast Asia and, and the number of SMEs there that produce components and uh, inputs into uh, much larger uh, uh, production uh, plants and, 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 and manufacturers, um, they will actually uh, need to step up, right? And what the great thing is, what this crisis has shown is that it actually doesn't take that much uh, to do these days, right? Because everybody is connected, right? And it's a matter of actually being able to get that information and share it widely. And there are some great platforms. And I think there'll be uh, great customers who will make those platforms available. And then, um, you know, a small suppliers who can click into that, right? And, and we have seen this happening uh, with other platform companies uh, that do crowdsourcing, uh, you know, like Uber, et cetera, where, you know, you as a driver can become fully integrated and full transparent with your information by simply having an app on your smartphone, right? And so I don't think it's going to take a lot for a lot of small to medium-sized companies, but I think it will be really important. And the role between customer and supplier is going to be critical. If I can also add, kind of build on to that, what you've hit on is three different points. And let me give you the three different. Number one, we're starting to put more and more attention on the small to medium-sized enterprises. Uh, in most of government, you tend to look at the large enterprises. But what we know is that, number one, in Australia, for example, small to medium-sized enterprises have always been the source of innovation from a social perspective. Number two, they're going to face challenges. And number three, they're going to, they, in some cases, have been the source of innovation. Uh, we have many of the interesting companies like M. Taylor in the States, which has design, you know, they can design, build clothing based on specifications that they me measure using your cell phone are small companies. But the challenge that we're now going to see is that the small companies have to be protected. They have to be nurtured and they have to be helped because they're going to be faced by a whole series of challenges uh, we haven't even talked about. One of the challenges we're going to be faced by in the near future is as we start to reshore, as we start to innovate, cyber re assets become important. In the environment, the weak point is going to be the small to medium sized enterprise. And if you want to see what's happening, I'm going to suggest that you take a look at a report that's just come out of the United States government. Look for the Cyberspace Solarium. Just look up on cyberspacesolarium.gov. And what they're talking about is the movement that's taking place in cybersecurity and the role that's going to have to be played by small to medium sized companies. It is absolutely eye opening. And yet they're the organizations we often know the least about. Okay, so I have um, lots of questions here. I think we have time only for a couple of them left. Um, I've got a very interesting one from Anrik Sohal from Monash University in Melbourne. And um, he asks Stephen Melnick, we haven't considered how universities are going to respond and change. Can you comment, please? 
<laughs> and this, well, is, this is in the light of, of some news I saw this morning where it said that the universities are going to ask the government for a lot of um, uh, loans or at least a lot of funding because of, of the problem. Well, there, there's several dimensions to the question. The first dimension is uh, the delivery of knowledge. Uh, what we're trying to see is that we have coped very successfully with the use of digital platforms. Uh, I hate to say this, but universities right now, there's pressure. I don't know about what, I know it's in Australia, I know it in the, in the States, where people are trying to justify the value of the investments made in universities. And they're looking at digital platforms as a, as a way of leveraging it. So the first thing is we're going to be looking at how do you deliver material? And that's going to force us to re-examine how, you know, to what extent do we use face-to-face, -to, -face, to what extent do we use uh, ver digital platforms? We're coming to the conclusion at State that for content-specific knowledge, digital works wonderfully. The second is the tools we teach. Um, when I look at a lot of the stuff we teach, a lot of the stuff that I've of the tools that are being used by industry that are highly successful in dealing with these issues, we don't even teach in our programs. For example, I talk to people and they talk about scenario planning. We're not even teaching it to our students. We teach deliberate decision making. We don't teach fast decision making. We get people to understand big data without understanding that that's only one aspect. And you have to think about it in terms of an integrated environment. So. Number one, there's how. Number two, there's what. And number three, there's what we're doing research in. I'm going to simply point out that there's an interesting article that just occurred, appeared today out of McKinsey. And it was directed at top managers, the, the board of directors. And it also, as a sidebar said, and academics, which I consider myself one at times, uh, they said, you know, there's a new role because number one, you have to explain what's going on. And number two, we have to look at this as what are the new opportunities? And too often, we tend to be trapped by our methodologies. Mm -hmm. And this is yeah. an example where we have to move from being methodological move yes. to being problem focused. Right. Thanks for that, Steve Melnick. Um, this is a question for all my panelists. And we have, I know we're already past the time, but it's too good a question to let go. The question is, how do we help, this is from Stefan, how do we help change the procurement practices of government beyond cheap? So better ensure better long-term supply chain and operational costs are included in the decision making. For example, encouraging and allowing for flexibility of choosing and changing to local suppliers during the term of supply contracts. My background is in politics originally, and I, what I would say is that look at how businesses are actually tackling most of the problems, whether it's climate change, whether it's the trade wars, whatever. Uh, around the world, a lot of corporations now have stopped waiting for government. The governments have spent over the last decade, certainly just, just in the climate change space, they've wasted a decade. And businesses went, well, we can't wait anymore. We start making our own decisions. Investors have been driving a lot of decisions for us. People put their money where they they have faith or trust in where they put their money. It's no longer just the, you know, knowing the value or something. I don't think going forward, we will continue to rely on government to give us the answers. And if government doesn't want to help create a resilient and uh, flexible, transparent supply chain, I think businesses mm -hmm. will just do it. I think, Greg, you're, you're bang on. Uh, you know, for, for, for decades, uh, you know, businesses have been leading the way in, in many of these aspects, uh, you know, and government has been lagging. Certainly, you know, uh, you know when you think about uh, procurement practice, et cetera, uh, there's a great opportunity here for business to lead the way and show deliberate decision making that uh, looks beyond unit cost, right, and, and actually takes into account long term risk the equation of evaluating and selecting uh, uh, procurement uh, decisions. So, um, you know, I think great opportunity, A, for uh, academics to, to uh, update the theory and the business rules and the assumptions uh, to train the next generation and B, for business to show the way and be on the cutting edge of this uh, for, for government. I think business, the government's gonna have to change. And the reason the government's gonna have to change is because its supply base is shrinking. 
And when the number of companies who want to deal with the government shrinks, you have less competition, you have more opportunities for collusion, you have higher prices, lower innovation. That's just research-based. Uh, in the United States, we found the reason I was approached by the Department of the Navy was because on July 18th, 2019, an article appeared in Bloomberg Law, which pointed out that the DOD, the Department of Defense supply chain, had shrunk by 31% in 10 years. So number one, you're going you're gonna to be forced to do it. We, the government is not perceived as a good customer. And if you want to succeed, you've got to be a good customer. Number two, you now have an interesting opportunity. When I was in Australia, one of the things I was shocked at is that procurement, specifically strategic procurement, which is one of the hallmarks of supply chain in the States, taught at almost every leading edge school, is not taught at the universities. And yet it is more important in, the, in Australia's case than, is, than are issues such as logistics and operations. So you have an opportunity to establish a new field. And by doing it, you can establish and broaden it to include not only private procurement, but public procurement and its challenges, and to look at the opportunities. So there, I'm done. All right, thank you. At this stage and on behalf of Macquarie Business School, I'd like to convey my sincere appreciation to all our panelists, uh, Craig Carmody, uh, Olaf Shetterman and, and Stephen Melnick. We really appreciate you sharing your organizational challenges, your industry experiences and considerations for future directions in supply chains. I'm so glad to have my team with me, uh, Razia Tavaloy and Roger Moza. Certainly value your support through the conduct of these webinars. You've been great. Um, very grateful to our sponsor, the Port of Newcastle and Quarry Business School. And also thank you to our supporters, the Australasian Supply Chain Institute, ASCII, uh, MGSM uh, Alumni Association and the Center for Workforce Futures. Finally, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for staying this distance with us and for all your interesting questions and apologies if we could not get to all of them. Uh, like we did for our first two webinars, we will uh, release the recording of the session to all those who registered and you are free to use that uh, as illustrations or discussion points at your workplaces, lectures and meetings. Uh, we hope you remain safe and well, especially in these very difficult times around the world. Take good care of your families, your supply chain partners, your organizations, your customers and employees. We wish you all the best. Thank you.